this is Jeff Steiner from Americans in France, and I am talking with Sylvia Sabius. Sylvia, are you there? Hello, Jeff. How are you? Bonjour. I'm good. How are you today? I am very good, too. And where are you? I'm here um, on the Rue du Cherche Midi in the 6th arrondissement of Paris. Wow, Paris. An American in Paris. I am an American in Paris. <laughs> How long have you been in Paris? Yet another. Another. How long have you been in Paris for? I've been here um, for 12 years now, this time. But I did my studies here earlier, before that. And what do you like to do on the weekends in Paris? On the weekends in Paris, we have errands to run because Saturday is the one day all the shops are open and we can do everything we couldn't do during the work week. And then we like to go to art galleries and art exhibits and art shows and maybe some theater and then a little more art. <laughs> Uh, what, what kind of art galleries? All over the city. I really like the Rue um, Saint-Anne in the second arrondissement where there's um, a lot of Japanese restaurants. There are also some small art galleries that are very interesting because they will have work by very famous artists, but it'll be a sketch for something he had worked on, not the actual piece. Or they'll have somebody from a school of a very famous artist. So you can see really, really beautiful art and um it's more accessible. So I like seeing, and you get to see the process, which is really interesting. And the art galleries are private? Um, those are private art galleries. We also go to an ex exhibition most weeks. Last week I went to the Musée Mayotte to see the exhibition on Murano glass, which was fascinating. I expected it to be all the old traditional Murano glass, and it starts off with some very contemporary work from a live artist, which I hadn't expected, and it was a beautiful show. And it was small. I like when the show is small enough to really digest. Right now, there's Eileen Gray at the Pompidou, a really interesting woman who had come, who came to Paris and um, was doing furniture for a lot of the fashion, Madame Grez and the fashion world in the beginning of the 20th century. I tried to go to the Hopper, and it was totally sold out, and I didn't realize that I should have bought tickets like months in advance. That's happening more and more. I know Chagall is at the Luxembourg Gardens is sold out weeks and weeks in advance. I would love to go, but I, I just don't know three weeks in advance what I'm doing that Saturday. Yeah, right. I, mean, I haven't been able to get that yet. but And it's becoming more, more and more people are complaining about it. It's becoming more and more of an issue because even if you have a ticket that you've pre-purchased, when you get in there, it's really hard to see the art. There's just so many people. But art galleries, the art like that, become more popular over the years, as you've been in Paris, over the 10 years? Absolutely. They're full. They're full. And it's young people. And my daughters love to go. Really? Yeah. Yeah, my teenagers, they'll, they don't want to go with me. <laughs> they don't want to go with you, but they want to. My son, they went to the, when we were there in November, last November, they went to Louvre, but it was kind of quick. My son was just going, bl blowing through the, the Louvre and just going like, you know, five minutes in each room. Something like that. Well, it's good. They get it at their pace. Exactly. They, not at our pace, but at their pace. That, that. It gets to them at some point. I mean, I had at one point there, they went on strike and they said no more museums. And I said, okay. And then they started going back on them. And the, the Louvre, they just opened the new Islamic wing right. that I visited a couple of weeks ago. That was fantastic. Was it really worth it? It was. It was. An, it's an extraordinary collection. It's really well presented, and the architecture in the space is, is very nice. How they've melded the old with the new. It's. It's and made it that Eastern feeling in a Western palace. What's it like being a mother in France? Or... Um, I think that's when most of the cultural differences come up. Are your kids more French than American? I have one of each. One was eight when we moved here. One was five, and the eight-year-old is more. I'd say slightly more American. The five-year-old is slightly more, well, she's just French. The older one actually went to, away to the University of Chicago this year, and she finds it really interesting because she had always thought of herself as American, and yet being there, she also is not American either. She's kind of something in the middle, neither one, no, neither one nor the other. Yeah, I kind of feel that too. Do you feel that also when you go back to America? Yeah, I can't order a coffee. They've changed all the names. You just want a cup of coffee, and they say venti, latte, grandi. I say get a cup of coffee. Exactly. What about the school system? How do you feel about the school system in France? I had my kids in public school for quite a while, and when they got to junior high, it just I had to put them in a bilingual school. It wasn't working for me anymore or for them. But um, it's an excellent education. It's very difficult. It's extremely difficult. You get graded on a score of 20, and it's virtually impossible to get 20 out of 20, whereas in the U.S. you could get 22 out of 20. Yeah, the thing I've discovered is that in, uh, in America it's more grade inflation, whereas in France it's really deflation. They don't, they don't, they almost want to 
um, make it so you because it's ten, basically ten is the passing, ten out of twenty is the passing grade, and it's like getting that ten a little bit over can be really difficult. When my daughter comes home with a fifteen, she her feet aren't touching the ground. She's so happy, and I'm thinking there's something horribly wrong. We have to get tutors. <laughs> yeah, the American way. No, man. Yeah, because they're supposed to. There's not that um, that positive reinforcement. It just doesn't really exist. Then they would. That's one of the things that happened at the junior high. The the teacher, the English teacher, would always ask one question. That if you spoke fluent American English, you would get it wrong. And she would ask another question. That if you spoke fluent British English, you would get it wrong. So she had all these fluently bilingual kids, even though it was a public school. Uh huh. And nobody could ever get 20 out of 20 on an exam, even though they all spoke English better than she did. Oh, because she was mixing, yeah, the mixing it up. That's she was she was doing it on purpose. She didn't want to have to be giving out 20s. Tell us about your blog. It's called Finding Noon, since I live on the Cherche Midi. I write about visits to art museums. I write about uh, fashion shopping. I get I was able to see several fashion shows now for Paris Fashion Week, and I get to see a few more every year. I really love, that's one of the first thing that drew me to Paris when I was much, much younger was just the fashion design and style and everything. Um, and then I write about daily life recently. Not right now I'm working full time for a client in their offices and I just write about the pressure of getting dressed to work with all these beautiful Parisians. I write about um, the this, this schedule of a day in Paris, how I don't start till 10, so I have my whole morning to get everything done, but I also don't get home till 8 o'clock at night. Is Paris how you imagined it would be? It is, because I did not come here with rose-scented glasses. I knew that, I had been a student here, I knew life here can be very, very difficult, and that the paperwork and the, some of the day-to-day -day things can be very demoralizing, and you just... I picked my problems. Everywhere in the world has a ton of problems, a ton of great things to offer. I come from San Francisco, a beautiful city. Um, but the problems that I face day to day in Paris were the problems that suited me better than the problems I face day to day in San Francisco. What about some tips for shopping in Paris? My biggest tip I want to start getting out there to the world is don't be intimidated to go into those designer shops. Because so many people come here and they love that and they walk to the front door and they're afraid to go in and they're not going to be buying anyway. And you don't have to be buying. These people, it's about the design. It's about the fabrics. Um, the salespeople are extremely well educated. They love talking about their subject. And um, it's an education. I encourage people to walk through that door if, if that's something that interests you. And ask questions and don't be afraid to try things on. What street would this be? What, or what neighborhood would, would, would one of these shops be at? Avenue Montaigne has the shops that have the most selection. I like Saint Honoré. It's smaller, more intimate. And they're both, it's the same collection of stores with Yves Saint Laurent and uh, Prada, even though it's Italian, it, it's there. Um, and I, for me, I, I'm a more smaller, intimate kind of shopper, so I'm more comfortable in Saint Honoré, but um, the true houses are on Avenue Montaigne. And the Louis Vuitton store, I was there last Sunday actually, they have an art gallery on their top floor. And if you go in through the side entrance, there's, as you're looking at the building on the Champs-Élysées, there's a side entrance to the right where you don't wait in line with the people who want to go in and shop. You feel like you're walking in an office building because you are, it's, it's um, also their offices. And you go in and you tell them you want to go to the art gallery. And if you do that, um, they will escort you up in an elevator that's been done by the artist Ulfur Eliasson. He's Swedish. He's a fantastic artist. Um, he created this elevator for them, and it takes you right to the top floor where there's a free art gallery. The show just ended. It was about mail and pieces of mail and how they were made into art. Um, but a new show is, is sure to come in the next couple of weeks. It's a, you, you, you see the rooftops of Paris, it's a beautiful view, it's a small museum, so it's a, a, just a quick time, and it's, it's a really great thing to do. Can you give it the location again? It's the Louis Vuitton flagship store on the Champs-Élysées. And was it difficult you, for you to find work in France? It's very difficult to find work in France. I was fortunate, my, the father of my children, he has French citizenship, so I, I was able to get citizenship and work papers immediately. 
I did not go to school here. I do not have a network here. I do not have a traditional uh, education for my profession. I'm a copywriter, and I did not go to an advertising school. I went to UCLA and studied literature. And so it's difficult because I don't have a traditional background for what I do. And there is ageism in France. They, I've been told in a job interview, you're too old. I've been asked, do you think you can keep up? And I'm not even 50 yet. So let's say I'm, I'm three days in Paris. What should I do? Have a picnic. Even if it's a cold, rainy time of year and it's on your bed in your hotel room, going to the local markets and picking up a few cheeses, whatever the fruits that happen to be in season, a baguette, and just making a simple picnic in your room, toasting to Sam's champagne is just a really wonderful experience for new flavors and, and really getting to experience Paris. It doesn't even necessarily have to be a market. You can go to a shop and buy some uh, get a baguette. Even the most common grocery stores have incredible things. You can get Maha des Bois strawberries, and you taste a strawberry like you've never tasted before. And it doesn't have to be super fancy or expensive or luxurious, and it's just a completely wonderful experience and very unique to Paris. Where would you suggest having a picnic? One of my favorite places for my picnics is a garden, the Catherine Labouré Garden on the Rue de Babylone. It's in the 7th arrondissement near the Sèvres Babylone Metro, a closed garden. It was part of a convent. It has a kitchen garden with espadrille trees. It has a grass area that you can sit on. And it, because it's a walled garden, you don't see it from the street. People walk by and they never go in. And it's so it's a really neighborhood little jewel full of kids running around, having fun, everyone having a picnic. The museum, besides Musée d'Orsay or Louvre, or the, the, the usual suspects that you would suggest somebody go visit. I love taking people to the Rodin Museum, especially people who are not necessarily into museums or art, because you can just go to the garden and enjoy the garden. There's a museum. It's the Petit Palais. It's the small palace that was built for the international exhibition. It's right in front of the Grand Palais. It's free because it belongs to the city of Paris. And I actually like just going into the courtyard um, on a sunny day. They have a cafeteria with a cafe and a beautiful garden. Besides like the Eiffel Tower, where, where's a good place to get a view which you, that you would say are a unique view of Paris? Well, there's that art gallery at the top of Louis Vuitton that has a stupendous view really of the rooftops because you're at the level of the rooftops. And right now everyone is talking about the restaurant Le Ciel de Paris, which is at the top of the Montparnasse Tower. And they got a new chef about a year ago, so the cuisine is exceptional right now. It's not just, it used to be just tourist food and not very good. And now it's very good food and you have a view over Paris that includes the Eiffel Tower. And my other favorite place for a view of Paris is the hot air balloon at the Parc André Citroën in the 15th. Um, okay, is there anything else you wanted to mention? Get lost. That's my third thing to do in Paris after picnics in a museum is get lost. Just go out the door. I like to take a different route home than I'd leave from my home, even my home, which I'm here every day, because things are constantly changing and happening in every neighborhood. Um, you stumble upon a bookbinder. Recently in my neighborhood, I stumbled upon a, a gentleman. I thought he, was, he restored art. It turns out he has a a collection of antique books that is just phenomenal. He has playing cards that were owned by Marie Antoinette. Um, and you just look in windows and stroll and walk and, and you find phenomenal things to, to look at. And again, like the fashion, these people are passionate about what they do. They are happy to speak to you and share with you. Um, and they try hard to speak English and communicate. And even if they don't speak English, sign language works. What would be some suggestions you would have for somebody thinking of moving to France? I think that everybody has to follow their dream. And it is not easy. And um, I would say if you have to work for a living, make sure you have your paperwork or a way to get your paperwork fairly quickly. And just do not expect anything to work like it works in the U.S. Thank you very much, Sylvia. It's been really nice talking with you. Thank you for your time and have a great day. 